This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. May 15, 2012, the culmination of the largest and most complex seismic test ever conducted, a project comprised of 13 earthquake motions and six fire tests. Now this specially designed and instrumented building is about to experience one of the most severe earthquake motions ever recorded. Why? Back in 1971, a moderate magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake struck Southern California with devastating consequences. It was like a harder shake and a harder shake. The crunching to me was like a roar. I heard a lot of rumble. Maybe it was the earth, maybe it was what was falling. All the false ceilings, they're coming down. And uh, is there gonna be a roof behind it? Closets were falling onto beds. Furniture was moving around, glass breaking, people yelling. Seconds later, you felt the sensation of going down. We used to be on the second floor and we had become the first floor. If the earthquake had hit later in the day, I, I don't know how anybody would have been able to get out of those offices fast enough. Fortunately, at 6 a.m., the ground floor offices of this building at the Olive View Medical Center in Silmar were vacant. However, the 800-bed main hospital building, occupied by over 600 patients at the time, suffered severe damage and narrowly avoided collapse. Miraculously, only three lives were lost throughout the entire medical center. Unfortunately, nearby Olive View, four of the San Fernando Veterans Administration Medical Center's oldest buildings collapsed catastrophically, claiming 49 lives and severely impacting emergency services. In 1971, we found out the hard way that uh, hospital facilities uh, have to be designed to meet a different performance level. California responded, improving codes and standards that made our hospitals safer. However, in 1994, the Northridge earthquake still had a devastating impact on hospitals, causing non-structural damage, like collapsed ceilings, broken sprinkler piping, damaged generators, broken air handling units, and damage to hospital equipment that forced many of them out of operation just when they were needed most. They were doing triage in the parking lots. Uh, there was no water, uh, there was no power, but uh, they may do. It's not the situation that we want for the future. Again, Californians responded, improving the requirements for the safety and continued operation of our hospitals. This is because Californians know that earthquakes like these are a certainty, and with a devastating earthquake in our future, California has continued to improve requirements to ensure the reliability of our hospitals. That's why the California Seismic Safety Commission supported an historic project dedicated to ensuring that those efforts are effective at securing the future of our hospitals. It's important to realize that the day will come when we will have a major earthquake in our state and it will significantly disrupt an entire region of the state. As a result of that, we need the hospitals to be physically strong enough um, inside and out, to be able to withstand the shaking and continue functioning. The one place we need to be in really good shape are the hospitals. And so how can we develop codes for hospitals that will ensure that everything that's in a hospital continues to operate afterwards? To achieve these goals, the National Science Foundation and the California Seismic Safety Commission brought together an extraordinary consortium of industry, scientists, 
engineers and designers from across the country and around the world on this project. The intent is to shake the building until it begins to fail. We can identify what parts are as strong as people thought they would be, what may be stronger than they thought they would, and what may be weaker than they thought they would. And it will not only test the building, but it will test the contents of the building. The other thing that we'll do with this building after the shaking is done is to set it on fire. This is an opportunity for us to try to find out how a fire will behave in a building that has been damaged by a seismic event. The new knowledge that is gained will help designers, contractors, uh, and regulators improve performance of buildings and their internal components, and in the end, the benefactor is the public at large. The project also benefits the hundreds of industry partners who contributed to the effort. Matt Haler of Hilti International explains what some of those benefits are. You can look at an individual anchor, you can look at a, an individual pipe ring performance, and you can test the heck out of it, but you really don't get the full picture until you test this thing in the system. This is such a unique opportunity for us to see what happens when all of these systems are connected with each other. Then when we go back to looking at the individual components, we can do it within the context of the entire system, which just makes it that much more valuable to us. Floor by floor, five stories in all, from the foundation to the massive air conditioning equipment on the roof, from the structural frame to the healthcare equipment that eventually fills the building. The structure is specially designed to meet the intent of current building code requirements. The exterior has common facade systems, and the interior is furnished with typical partition walls and complete ventilation, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, including different fire sprinkler and ceiling systems. And for the first time anywhere, a full-scale, fully functioning elevator, an element of hospital buildings that is critical. On two floors are a variety of actual devices and furnishings used in an acute care facility, from surgical lighting, beds, cabinets, a patient lift, and medical freezer, to medical gas and utilities booms and head walls, even packets of plasma and full-scale patient dummies. Other floors replicate typical office residential and laboratory uses not subject to special code requirements. Over a one-month period, the building was subjected to ground motions created by one of the most unique facilities on Earth, the Nice UCSD Large High Performance Outdoor Shake Table that is managed by the National Science Foundation at UC San Diego's Engelkirk Structural Engineering Center. After days of testing with a variety of ground motions, the team is ready to conduct a crucial sequence that will directly test current codes and practices. First in the sequence, a near design level earthquake event. This is a test using an earthquake motion that occurs approximately every 475 years, with the expectation that the hospital building will remain functional. With the foundation fixed to the table, the researchers use a record from the 7.9 Denali earthquake of 2002. Two, one, the Denali quake is a phenomenal record. Over two minutes of violent shaking, the images speak to the devastating power of this quake. After the record, the research team and their industry partners swarm over every inch of the building and its systems to see just what effect the motions had on every element of the building. They document movements, 
changes and any damage. These observations and the visual records are correlated with the instrument data to provide a clear and complete picture of the building's response. Throughout the weeks of testing, witnessing firsthand how systems perform is a one-of-a-kind benefit for both the researchers and the industry partners. We want to make sure that the door closes properly and latches in place and maintains a seal. We've done smoke testing, but now let's see it in real life and see what happens in a seismic condition. And that's, that was, to me, that was well worth it. Our elevator sustained the seismic event we created here and without any problem there at all. It looks good. The elevator is still running as a perfect elevator. It's very important for us as on the technical side. I think it's one thing in a in lifetime you get this opportunity. For the first time ever, this test has shown how both structural and non-structural designs and codes hold up to a severe design level earthquake. Bob Bachman, an expert instrumental in the development of many existing seismic codes, comments on the preliminary observations. We're very pleased with the way it's performing. There's just limited damage to the building structure right now, and so it could actually take a lot more motion before it would consider collapsing. The medical floors did very well. Uh, the equipment that was anchored stayed in place. The things that should fall over fell over because they were not anchored properly. It was unfortunate that we saw beds turn over, but generally speaking, things that were anchored did well. We saw damage to the stairs. It's not that the stairs can't take it, but some of the detailing we have to go back and look at because that can be improved. The elevator did very well, which was very good. And so we were very pleased about that because this is the first time we've had a working elevator going on. Our, our cooling tower on the roof worked really well. The uh, whole vibration isolation system for the cooling tower worked just the way we wanted it to. And so the anchorage there was great. The one thing we, uh, we are going to want to look at more carefully is we have the special type of uh, outside cladding in the lower three floors that the internal framing of that really got uh, destroyed. Now it would have to be totally replaced once the damage was found. So generally the damage levels are uh, uh, what we were hoping for and it, it sort of tells us that uh, how we were approaching the design is good. What we follow in our cold rules worked and we we're very pleased about that. Finally, it is time for the ultimate test, a motion that exceeds a maximum credible earthquake event. This is an earthquake that happens approximately every 2,500 years. Codes and designs for this motion have the performance expectation that the building will not collapse, but will lose functions and be severely damaged beyond repair. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, Five, four, three, two, one, violence and severity of the quake is clear. This would be a frightening experience not soon forgotten. The forces and displacements on the structure are extreme. At points during the shaking, floors two and three are displaced by nearly a foot in both directions. The heavy upper cladding is shaken violently, but remains attached. The lower cladding tears like paper. Interior furnishings are thrown about by the violent accelerations. Those that are unrestrained are tossed about like toys, while anchored items ride out the seismic storm, jerked to and fro, along with the walls and floors to which they are attached. Close inspection reveals that the building suffers irreparable damage. I think this building uh, in a real world situation would be condemned. The columns, the base of the columns, are, the concrete is falling off. 
especially the two columns on the east. There is a beam, a beam at the top of the first story where there is a full plastic hinge formation with a lot of concrete that detached. You see these, these uh, blocks of concrete here. We can see the rebars. They are naked now. At different floors, you can see the formation of the punching failure mechanism of the slab around the column, not far from really collapsing. From the third floor to the fourth floor, the stairs uh, are detached. They are hanging. There are a lot of gypsum board, huge gypsum board that detached, that fell off. At every floor, the frame of the elevator door has been seriously damaged. The doors are, are locked, uh, you know, in an oblique fashion. But the building has done its duty. It bent and cracked, but did not collapse. You know, it satisfied the design objective that the structural system should still stand, even though maybe close to collapse, but still stand. It resisted, so it's a, it's a success. In the weeks prior to conducting these ultimately damaging tests, the team had tested the building on seismic isolators in order to directly compare the effects of seismic isolation on the performance of non-structural elements. These huge rubber pads, each weighing over half a ton, support the building on four points, one at each corner of the structure, isolating the building from the earth and its motions. In a test using a record from the magnitude 8 Ica Peru earthquake of 2007, the effect of base isolation becomes obvious. As the table displaces, the isolators provide elastic joints between the earth and the structure, dramatically attenuating the accelerations that are transmitted to the building. The contrast with the motions in the other tests is clear. With isolators, the building slides back and forth smoothly and easily. While objects and fixtures shift, the violent displacements and the destruction they wrought upon the building in the fixed foundation tests do not occur. 90% or so of the displacement that actually was imparted on the building was absorbed by the isolator. And so the result is relatively minimal impact on the contents and the non-structural elements in the building. The hospital could remain functioning. The patients would be saved. The equipment, critical support equipment, would remain functioning. The electrical system in this building remained functioning. So life support equipment for patients would remain functioning. That's essential. The elevator remained functioning, the stairs were completely intact, so paths of egress through the building remained functional, so that's a success. With seismic testing complete, it is time for fire testing. Led by Brian Meacham from Wooster Polytechnic Institute, these tests will for the first time anywhere observe how fire protection measures perform after seismic events. These measures are passive elements, as simple as the wall joints or specially designed fire blocking and stop materials that activate under heat. Also tested are active systems, the sprinklers, alarms, and a heat-activated fire door. Six different fire tests will be conducted in three areas on the third floor. The team initiates the first test. The sprinklers activate perfectly as designed, but for the purpose of the tests, the full flow of the sprinklers is limited in order to allow the fire to proceed. The fire door also performs as designed, another key feature that would contain the flames and allow the sprinklers to suppress the fire. The fire burns until all the air is consumed and the fire extinguishes itself. Then the team inspects the damage. You have to have the temperature high enough to call the auto. Over three days, the fire tests continue. The tests afford unprecedented opportunities for researchers and their industrial partners. The tests were also an unprecedented opportunity for firefighters to observe how both the fire and control strategies behave in an earthquake-damaged building.
We respond to structures that are intact and not damaged. Uh, this will be obviously a, a structure that's been significantly damaged by uh, an earthquake, and we do get that chance now to see how the, the fire is going to behave. From the damage that's here, our access to the building is going to be a challenge. We're not going to be able to use the elevators. We don't normally use elevators in a high-rise, but we will shuttle equipment that way. Stairwells are going to be compromised. You had a stairwell on this that, that broke off. So going into a building, we're going to have to definitely make sure the building is secure before we make access to, to the buildings. We're going to have a huge demand on manpower to get those people out of the buildings. It's going to be our big challenge, the rescue potential. So it's good to see the damage and, and know what to expect in an earthquake. Steve Hahn of Lawrence Doors reflects on the value of the project for their company. Watching the, the last shake in particular was a pretty amazing experience. It, uh, it definitely calls to mind how severe some of the earthquake motions can be. And being able to see something firsthand and, and witness what it goes through really helps us to, to know that what we think is going to happen is in fact what is going to happen. And this project has been uh, an extreme benefit. Uh, it's given us an opportunity to see things that we certainly, you know, in, in, in normal daily operation and applications, we would never have had the opportunity to see. Chad Strikey of Hilti North America monitored the performance of some of their innovative fire stop materials. It's been an unbelievable experience. Uh, being involved in this, and it's, you really get to see how your products work in a real world situation, especially under seismic conditions, that's just something that's never been done before. It's, it's, it's really, it's been a once in a lifetime uh, experiment. The tests culminate with burns in the elevator lobby. Here, the severe seismic shaking damaged the elevator door and walls, which will have an unknown effect on the progression of the fire. As warning alarms sound, the team ignites the fuel. Ignition, ignition. Team leader Brian Meacham monitors the progress of the fire. Smoke billows from windows and breaches in the walls. So about 300 degrees in the elevator shaft. The attending fire crew watches intently. The post burn inspection reveals another scene of destruction. With the sprinklers limited by the researchers, the fire was allowed to reach its maximum intensity, and in doing so, revealed an ominous effect of the seismic damage to the elevator. While smoke detectors continue signaling the presence of smoke and gases, fire test leader Brian Meacham explains. So we had an interesting fire effect in here that you don't see in a lot of fires given the ventilation conditions that we had. What we ended up getting was a vortex of intense burning in this area. So the cold air was being sucked in, but it was being forced right back down by the heat of the fire. You can see it melted out the controls, it destroyed the camera mount, a lot of damage in here. All of these gypsum board panels are shot. It has been three days of unprecedented testing. Brian Meacham shares his first observations of the tests and what they might mean. We're going to have damage of a significant nature in a lot of the buildings that we have today when a very large earthquake occurs. And the big concern from the fire protection side is if we're relying in those buildings on the compartmentation to be there, the stairs to be there for people to escape, the elevator for people to use, the partitions to be in place to contain the smoke from moving from one place to the other. It's not going to work in the way that we expect it to. While the tests revealed these and other potential risks, they also revealed some very positive performance, which can lead the way to developing a balanced approach to fire protection design to minimize these risks in the future. The sprinkler system performed well to the seismic tests and it performed well in terms of activation to these tests. Most of the fire stop material worked well and that was a good test of that material. The ceiling systems also performed very well. If you look at the ceiling systems on this floor where we burn, they're not warped, they're not damaged. The fires did not penetrate at all, so they performed extremely well. Those are all very good things 
And I think mostly what we learned is that the damage caused by the earthquake to these systems, so mechanical damage and not fire related, is what we really have to watch out for so that we design for that when we put these measures into place. The test phase is complete, but this is not the end. Tara Hutchinson, who led the project, summarizes some of what has been learned and where that may lead us in preparing our hospitals for the future. In terms of good performance, what we saw is that code performing, uh, well-designed, properly staged and anchored and strapped, hospital equipment performed very well. We saw no loss of functionality of the equipments that were powered, such as the lighting, powered oshpod ceilings, the hospital refrigerators. Um, we also saw little to no damage of these items. Uh, these findings, of course, are good for the community. However, we really had important lessons to be learned regarding loose, unanchored hospital equipment and contents, the tipping of patient beds, wire racks, uh, impacting of rolling hospital furnishings um, and equipment. In fact, most of the damage was caused by the tipping or impact of these unrestrained items. In terms of the structural response of the building, what we saw for the design earthquake was, was well aligned with what we anticipated from a strength perspective of the building, and that was well aligned with what we got, actually. Finally, we exposed this building to this very extreme earthquake, well above the design earthquake. The data from this will really be an immense impact for the field of earthquake engineering because the margin of safety can be evaluated, and we've really pushed the limits from that standpoint. I think the immediate follow-up to this work is the ramifications of the observations on current practice, building design codes and, and modeling of buildings. So I think we can do this by comparing what we've observed in these experiments to that which is dictated by the building code or that which would be used in a numerical model. Um, the logical procession then after this is the implementation of specific improvements both to design codes and to numerical models. When we think about the largest challenges that may emerge for the building industry, we, let's back up and think about the complexity of the non-structural components themselves, the interrelationship between these non-structural components, between themselves, amongst themselves, and as well with the building structure. We'll always have a situation where all of the components will be impacted by other components. And now these industries and these partners must work very closely together to find solutions. It's pretty clear from these tests that this issue actually will continue to emerge as the largest challenge for the building industry, particularly for hospitals. From my perspective, we really need to take a look at those ingredients which had been tested for the first time. The elevator, the stairs, the balloon framing, etc. We really need some follow-up experiments on these because there are other configurations that could dramatically change the mechanisms of damage that we saw in this test program. The other thing that I think we really need to think about to support additional post-earthquake live fire tests. Um, these were very revealing in this test program and they need to be pursued in follow-up testing. It's really been our goal from the onset of this program that knowledge learned through this collaboration with the community will support the public at large's need to have resilient and well-performing hospitals uh, in the future. The future? Downtown Los Angeles. Like any other major urban center in California, over 500 buildings exceeding five stories many exceeding 10 or more, hundreds of elevators. Within about five miles, there are seven hospitals with 911 emergency rooms and intensive care facilities, three of those trauma centers. On any day, over two million people are going about their business here. It's 1 p.m., 9 a.m., 6 p.m. Will it happen in 2,500 years? 500 years, or today, for certain it will. And when it does, will our hospitals have the resilience to keep on operating just when we will need them most? And what remains to be done so that they can? <laughs>